Welcome to a new episode of Draft Season. I am John Schmelk. It's all brought to you by Tommy Hilfiger, a PVH brand and an official partner of the New York Football Giants. I am John Schmelk. Eric Crocker, Tony Paulino, usual suspects. And for the first part of the show, we'll be joined by the great Dane Brugler, who, of course, covers the NFL draft for the athletic. Dane, how are you enjoying the first month or so of the college football season? Yeah, so far, so good. You know, we've uh, it's shaping up to be a really interesting draft class. Uh, the quarterbacks are a little bit better, so it's uh, a lot more fun to talk about those guys. Uh, but yeah, so far, so good. It's going to be a, a fun season. Yes, and I'm going to bury the lead. We're going to get to the quarterbacks last with Dane. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to get your take on this too, Tony, and you too, Croc, as guys that kind of rank these prospects more than me during the year. What's your process here, Dane? Do you have like a almost like a running power rankings thing with like your top 50 where you're adjusting the list every week? Is guys you know do more things and you learn more about these guys tony eric same thing for you how do you guys just continuously track where you have these guys in related to to the class overall dean you first well yeah for me uh, it starts in the summer where i build a database um you know i've got an excel spreadsheet where uh, you know thousands and thousands of players uh based off of talks with scouts uh, my own evaluations um you know rank these guys and then you, you know that that's your base you go into the season with already having expectations for what these players are and what they could be. And then as we go through the college football season, that's when you tweak it. That's when, uh, you know, you, the terms risers, fallers, that's where it's really relevant. Uh, during the season, you're watching the tape, you're figuring, okay, are these guys playing up to their potential? It, it says there's something going on with these guys. And so you, you adjust the rankings from there. I, for me, I did a top 50 in August before the season started, and then I probably won't do an updated top 50 uh, at least for a, another month or so, try to give, get more tape, get these guys at least, you know, uh, seven, eight games of the college season before we start, you know, making these declarative statements. Oh, he's jumping up around or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a, definitely a process. Tony, how about you? Yeah. I mean, similar. I, I watch game film throughout the summer. In fact, I'm, I'm still watching last year's game film on the small school guys. And, and that's how I, uh, get my list and my quote unquote rankings, or at least I, I like to consider rankings. I mean, my grades on my guys. And at this point in time, I'm usually more conservative with my grades because I like to see a degree of progress in a player's game, a degree of improvement. Uh, I really don't start watching this season's film, the 2022 film until November, because, you know, you, you need some sort of foundation. You need something to build up on. And I, I think the worst thing that people do is they go gaga over a guy based on a single game performance. You know, I will write about risers and sliders. And I always said, he, well, he has the potential if he keeps heading in this way because we're so early in the season. And, you know, once in a while, there'll be a guy that'll come out of nowhere. Zayvon Collins a couple of years ago, you know, people, uh, Tyler Smith, well, Tyler Smith was pretty good as a uh, sophomore as well. But, you know, you always got to keep uh, your ear to the ground for those names that others are talking about, scouts in the league uh, that may not have made that initial list over the summer. Um, but you know, you, you always, I try and be more conservative at this point in, point in time, because I want to see these guys improve if they don't improve or if they regress, it'll be reflective in the grades. How about you, Croc? Yeah, I look at other guys lists. So I'll check out, you know, Dane's or Tony's and some other lists around and I'll see, okay, who do people think the top guys are? And if we, Every once in a while, I'll go to Twitter as well. And I'll say, hey, you know, who are you guys watching film on? And I kind of do that over the summer where I kind of, that's kind of how I build my database of who's who. And then just throughout the season, I'll take note on different things I'm, I'm watching. Like, you know, we'll get to some of these receiver prospects, but like A.T. Perry, right? And I'm watching them against uh, Clemson and kind of what he's doing to the defense and coming his strengths and weaknesses and whatnot. But as far as like really diving into tw all 22 film of the 23 class, that's probably later, like really kind of more towards uh, senior bowl, kind of in that range where I have a database where I can just kind of really go in and watch four or five games, three, four or five games of a guy and then come away with my thoughts. But uh, initially it's going off of other guys list and just getting my initial thoughts on what I'm seeing from a player. All right, so Dane, let's start here. How is this class shaping up? If you want to talk about overall strength, that's fine. What position groups seem to be emerging? It seems that it's it's a strong trenches draft, on at least on the defensive side of the ball. How do you see this class kind of slowly forming in your eye as we've gotten through about a month of college football? Yeah, definitely a few positions are really standing out. Um, I, I think corner has a lot of uh, potential. Uh, running back, we should see three to four running backs drafted top 50 this year. Uh, and I think there's some quality depth in the mid-rounds. 
Uh, quarterback, uh, no doubt, you know, like I said, anything would have been an upgrade over last year's class, but uh, teams are really intrigued with uh, some of these underclassmen with Bryce Young and CJ Stroud. Uh, Will Levis is a top senior. There, there's a handful of uh, interesting senior quarterbacks after Levis that could be in that mid round mix. But yeah, I mean, you alluded to it. it. It all starts with the defensive line, both on the edge and then inside a defensive tackle. I think a lot of people would uh, maybe argue the top two players in this class are on the defensive line with Alabama's Will Anderson, Georgia's Jalen Carter, uh, and maybe not necessarily in that order. Uh, there, there's some uh, debate there, but uh, it, it doesn't end there. There's plenty of interesting pass rushers in this class. Defensive tackle last year, you could argue, was the worst position uh, in last year's draft, but it's a p- potential to be one of the better positions this year, especially with these underclassmen, uh, Brian Brze uh, at Clemson, uh, Ika at, at Baylor, Gervon Dexter at Florida, uh, Mozzie Smith. If he's going to play like he did against Maryland this past weekend, uh, if he's going to play like that every week, he'll be in that mix as well. So plenty of names on this defensive line who uh, we'll be talking about a lot the next few months. Is that how you see it too, Tone? Well, I, I think Mozzie Smith, and we talked about this last show uh, when we had Bruce Feldman on. I mean, Mozzie Smith right now is uh, a top 20 player for me uh, based on the uh, on last year's film. Because as I said, the last show, everybody was talking about Ajabu and Aiden Hutchinson. But when you re- really watched the film, it was number 58 in the middle of that line that was commanding double teams and collapsing the pocket. Uh, and I just think that people are going to fall in love with Mozzie Smith. I'm not as high as the, on the cornerback class. I think it does have some potential, but... I don't know that I see any Ahmad Gardner's or Derek Stingley's right now. I think one of the other guys that's going to be left out of the conversation is Miles Murphy, of, or it's not being talked about enough as Miles Murphy. I would agree, though. I, I think that this parallels last year's draft, and everyone's going to be want, want to search for the quarterback, and we do have some potentially very good quarter, quarterbacks, as Dane mentioned. But I think right now, when you look at it, the top of the draft, the best prospects are in that defensive front seven. How about you, Croc? What do you like out of this class so far? Yeah, same thing. And I mean, go back to the quarterback class. This is definitely much more intriguing than last season. I think, you know, 2022 draft, you were thinking, okay, there's going to be a Spencer Rattler or Sam Howe and some of these other guys that people like. And then, you know, you go through the season and you're watching these guys and you're evaluating them and guys are getting benched. And we've seen some of that early on already with Tyler Van Dyke uh, and some of these guys. So it's been intriguing for me to kind of see how everything plays out at the quarterback position. Dane, anyone that has really stepped up at any spot here, and you think really helped themselves with how they've played so far to start this year? Oh, yeah, definitely a few names. Uh, you know, guard Osiris Torrance, who he could have stayed at Louisiana uh, and still would have uh, been a day two draft pick. He follows uh, Billy Napier to Florida, and he's been playing at a high level against better competition. He's a people mover in the run game, gets the job done in pass pro. Uh, we've seen Louisiana develop some of these offensive linemen in the last few years, but Torrance, he, he's the best of the group. I think he's better than Robert Hunt. Uh, who was drafted top 40 a couple years ago. And now showing what he can do in the SEC, that's putting him in the round one mix. Um, So he's a name that's really helped himself. Uh, Another one, another transfer, Florida State's Jared Verse coming over from FCS Albany. Uh, He's been sidelined the last few weeks with an injury, but he got off to such a hot start. His energy off the edge is exactly what NFL teams are looking for. And and then you'll, you'll need to bear with me. I need to pump two of my guys. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Two players that I ranked really high in the summer, and so far I think they've lived up to it. SMU receiver Rasheed Rice. He was my number one senior receiver in the preseason based off of what he did last year. So far he's, he's played like it. He, he leads the FBS in receiving yards, uh, a, a very high first down rate. He's a ball winner. Uh, body control, hand-eye coordination, uses his length really well. I'm not confident he'll be the first receiver, senior receiver drafted. I still think Tennessee Cedric Tillman – uh, it's probably the favorite there, but Rice has more than lived up to the hype. And then one of these corners that I really like this year, Oregon's Christian Gonzalez, he was in the top, my top 10 of my preseason top 50. That, that's how high I think of him. And I think he's, he's lived up to that long athletic. He can run right there. NFL teams are interested, but then you see his coverage skills, his awareness. He's getting better every single week. Gave up a touchdown in the opener against uh, Georgia, but he's been a lockdown player ever since that game. So traits, skill set, I absolutely uh, believe he's in that CB1 conversation. Tony, I saw you nod nod in your head when he mentioned Rice. Anyone else jump out to you? Well, uh, the thing about Rice is you got to remember, he's the man now in that SMU offense. I mean, they had two damn good receivers last year. One was taken in the third round. Uh, The other one, Roberson, was probably a a, a mid-round pick, but the medicals pushed him out of the draft. 
now he's the guy at SMU. He doesn't have those two other guys to kind of take the pressure off of him. And he's really elevated his game. He has played lights out. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, a week two riser on, on my list because he's played so well. And, and again, uh, you know, look at the progress in his game. Look where he is this year compared to a year ago, which is what I really like. You know, one guy, you, you talk about Ohio State, everyone talks about C.J. Stroud. They talk about Paris Johnson, the, the uh, guard who moved to left tackle. I love their center, Luke, Luke Whitler. I mean, yeah. <laughs> watch that guy because uh, Ohio State has always produced good centers. They've always had a lot of good interior linemen. I think Wh Whipler is going to be the best center to come out of Ohio State uh, since Nick, Nick Mangle. This guy is that good. I have him rated higher right now than uh, Paris Johnson, who's still learning, in my opinion, to play that left tackle position. But Whipler is strong at the point of attack, and he's mobile. He gets out on the second level, and he devastates linebackers in motion and, and, and players in that uh, in that second and third level. Yeah, I was uh, watching the uh, uh, Ohio State Wisconsin tape yesterday, and that I mean CJ Stroud, the, the receivers. It's easy to uh, you know fall in love with the guys that are touching the ball, but you're absolutely right, Tony. The offensive line was just uh, amazing in that game. Uh, Keanu Benton, the nose tackle for Wisconsin, you didn't even know he was playing, yeah. and, and Whipler is a big part of that. So uh, the guard, uh, he's a true sophomore. We'll be talking a lot about him uh, in a few years here. Dewan Jones at right tackle. So yeah, that Ohio State offensive line is as much a reason for the success as anybody else uh, on that offense. And that was a huge matchup, the Keanu Benton, uh, Wh Wh Luke Whipler matchup. And, and Whipler mm -hmm. won out more times than not. I mean, that, that game was over early in the first quarter, so you, you really couldn't get your, your finger on the pulse. But uh, early on, uh, Whipler was getting the better of him. And Benton's a very highly rated defensive tackle. Yes. Crocker, anyone early in this year jumping out to you? You can go anywhere you want. Yeah, I think um, going to the running back position, and I think a lot of people knew, you know, Bajan Robinson and kind of what he can do and uh, Gibbs over there at Alabama. And those were kind of two of the top names. But, man, Blake Corum, and I know he had a huge game against Maryland, but just what it looks like, you know, just uh, understanding how to, you know, utilize his blocking, run off a guy's bus, the explosiveness, you're trying to, you're starting to see that uh, long speed, uh, contact balance, all those things that you like to see out of a running back. And I'm not sure exactly where he'll go and if he can continue to stack those type of games. But so far, I mean, watching him against Maryland and some of his other appearances, I'm like, okay, can he continue to get not 30 carries a game like he did against Maryland, but, you know, more than what he had gotten early in the season. No question about it. Dane, who needs to show more? You know, you and Tony talked about you guys watched the film from the year before, so you set expectations for yourself, right? right. Anyone for you, and then I'll, Eric, Tony, I'll get your take on this yeah. too, has not met maybe some of the expectations that you have for them heading into the year? Well, I, I think the low-hanging fruit answer uh, would be Florida quarterback Anthony Richardson. He, he was so good in that game against Utah in the opener um and then you know since then it's a little bit downhill now he, he he played okay against Tennessee but you know he's just he's so gifted uh as gifted as Cam Newton physically except he's probably faster um but he's just so young as a passer in terms of recognizing what the defense is trying to do uh just being able to settle himself down complete passes so what he does the next few months will really determine okay are we gonna be talking about him in the 2023 draft or more likely the 2024 draft so uh, TBD with him. Uh, and then on defense, I think Iowa State senior Will McDonald, uh, he, he's never going to be a high level run defender. And that, that's always a concern, but you better be a high level pass rusher if that's the case. And I, I just, I don't know, I want more from him. I expected more from him this season so far. He's averaging only two pressures per game uh, so far this season in four games. That's not going to cut it. Uh, there was definitely chatter among scouts in the summer about him maybe sneaking into the back end of round one because the last two years he's had double digit sacks. He's a guy that can get to the backfield, but uh, you know, he's just struggled to make much of an impact for the Cyclones so far this year. I think part of the problem with McDonald is he's out of place. I mean, they play a three man line. He's yeah. 230, 235 pounds. He's, you know, if he's going to play it with his hand in the ground, it's got to be in a four man line, even better, uh, better yet standing up over tackle, because when you watch him, he's very athletic. He can drop off the line and make plays in space. So, you know, I would agree with you. You know, one of those guys you expected more. You wanted to see some development in his game. I think really in the early part of the season, as far as guys you expect more, you just got to stay on the quarterback theme. I mean, Spencer Rattler sadly is proving that, in my opinion, where that 2020 was the exception to the rule. As Croc was saying before, a year ago at this time, we were talking about Spencer Rattler as being a top five pick. He was having troubles at Oklahoma, evidently uh, eventually found the bench. Just can't seem to get it back into gear. You know, you mentioned Tyler Van Dyke, who 
I was never very high on Tyler Van Dyke. I like the upside. I like the potential, but the inconsistency just drove me nuts at a position where you can't be very inconsistent. I would like to see more from Jaden Daniels at, at LSU as a passer. He's a good college quarterback. He's a good ball carrier, but I really want to see him uh, or hope that he can elevate his skills as a passer, which will help his draft stock. I don't know that he's going to do it under Brian Kelly at LSU because Kelly's never seemed to be able to develop quarterbacks when he was at Notre Dame. That was his uh, kryptonite, if you will. I like that you brought up Jaden Daniels because I'm going to go to Kayshawn Butte, who's kind of been a little bit of a disappointment. And, you know, okay, the quarterback situation, it's a little up and down with the accuracy and whatnot, but can you be a receiver that helps out your quarterback? Right, because even at the NFL level, it's not always going to be perfect. You got to go out there, you got to make plays. And I've seen Keishon Butte have opportunities to make plays and make his quarterback look good, and he's not coming down with it. Now, maybe we're spoiled by him, you know, playing at LSU and what we've seen from guys like Jamar Chase and what it looked like with him and Joe Burrow. And I'm not saying Daniels is uh, Joe Burrow at all, but Joe Burrow, I mean, the connection with him and Jamar Chase was, hey, I'm going to throw the ball in the area of him. He's going to come down with the ball. He's going to make me look good or make me right, even when I'm wrong. And right now, I mean, Keishon Boutte, I mean, this is probably as bad of a start to the season as he could have had and I don't think it's all because of quarterback position there's been drops there's been opportunities for him to make plays over defenders and he's not doing that part so I mean a guy who people have ranked in you know top 10 of this draft class to kind of start the season and I think we got to pump the brakes a little bit on that and see if eventually he can turn into that guy but I've been disappointed with what I was expecting to see from him and kind of the return on that right now and along those lines, I mean, we talked about the defensive line being a strength of this draft. Wide receiver, uh, you know, it's relative to the past few years, it's it's one of the weaker positions in terms of high-end talent. Last year, we had six receivers go top 20. Uh, several of those guys ha have, you know, shown out already at the NFL level. Uh, this year, we might not have a receiver drafted in the top 20. I mean, Jackson Smith and Jigba is a good player. I think he's going to be a good pro. I, I think Twitter likes him a little more than NFL teams do. Uh, Keishon Boutte, who, who you just talked about, maybe not living up to the potential of what, what we think he can be. He's just he has not been a clean prospect so far. So uh, and Jordan Addison, you know, that transfer to USC's uh, helping him show how electric he is. But he's not a lock to go top 20. So uh, I, the overall position at receiver, uh, I just you, you want to see a little more out of some of these guys to uh, justify drafting them very high in the draft. Yeah, no, that's something I, 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 at face value, I agree with what Dane's saying, but I, I'd say be careful only because at this point in time last year, the receiver class really didn't look very good. And I say that I'd say I bet you $100 and gave you 10 to 1 odds at this point last year that six receivers were going to go in the top 20 in the draft. You would have taken that bet because you, you would have said there's no way six receivers are going. So we don't know. I agree with what, what, what it seems like on paper. Um and again, like last year, we were at this point in time, a lot of us uh, were, were fawning over the tight end class, which kind of petered out at the end there. So uh, I agree. But again, this is why we're in the early stages at this point. All right. We've kind of pitter patted around the quarterback. So let's kind of dive into it, guys. Dane, we know about Bryce Young and CJ Stroud. Has anyone else entered that conversation with those two at the top of the class? Is Levis there or is it really a two man or maybe you think it's a one man conversation of, of who the top quarterback is going to be this, this spring? I don't know that anything's happened so far this year that's really changed, um, you know, what we thought going in. I think Bryce Young has been – if Bryce Young had, were a bigger quarterback, he'd be the clear-cut quarterback one, I think. Um, but he's so – he's very much an outlier. Uh, it's not just his height. You know, it's not Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray. Those guys were thicker. Those, those guys had some meat on the bones. Bryce Young is going to be, you know, under 200 pounds. And, and that's something that – is going to be a big deal when teams stack these players and, and consider drafting a quarterback high. But uh, Bryce Young has so much that translates to the next level in terms of his awareness, um, his ability to improvise, uh, whether he's in the pocket, outside the pocket, very accurate thrower. So Bryce Young, I, there's so much to like as long as you can, as long as you're okay with the size. C.J. Stroud, uh, it, it's a lot of fun to see him operate in that offense, the way he can layer the ball down the field, um, it, but he still has a few areas where he needs to get better. And he's, he's a redshirt sophomore. I mean, it's not a surprise that he's not a finished product just yet. And then with Will Levis, uh, physically, he might be the prototype. The, the size, the play strength, the arm strength, um, the athleticism that he brings. 
But again, he's still making some decisions he shouldn't. And, and that's something, he's only a second year starter, uh, even though he's a senior, fifth year senior, he's been around a while. This is only a second year. And you factor in new offensive coordinator. Uh, you factor in no more Wandale Robinson. He's dealing with a new cast around him. They lost three guys on their offensive line. Uh, he hasn't had Chris Rodriguez out there who's been suspended. He'll be back here uh, this weekend. But there's a lot of things in that Kentucky offense that I think it, it, it's, a, it's a moving situation. And I think how we feel about these quarterbacks now might change over the next two months and might ultimately decide, okay, how early are these quarterbacks going to go? What's the exact order? So now it's still a little too early to tell, but you know, the, the, all three of those guys have fans across the NFL. Yeah. I think the thing with young is every time you want to try and count him out or you want to try and put him down, you watch him against Texas and he methodically just surgically moves the team down the field, gets the ball in the end zone uh, and, and I agree with Dane. I, I mean, the, pro, the issues will be the physical aspects of it. He is not big. He doesn't have a really strong arm, especially compared to CJ Shroud. Uh, but, you know, those mental intangibles, the way he sees the field, the way he reads the defense, the way he uses all his targets, his accuracy, his pass placement. Uh, quick release, too, man. He gets just, that ball out quick. Just, I mean, it is just so appealing. Will Levis kind of scares me. I mean, yeah, he's got all the physical skills and he makes some beautiful passes. But there are times the ball is all over the place. And that sort of inaccuracy at, at, at the quarterback position does kind of scare me. I, I'd be shocked unless he goes to like the senior or senior ball or even the shrine game and has three days of knockout practice where someone's going to fall in love with him. I think Will Levis is far, far below the uh, top two guys. I think the one guy that is intrigues me and he's someone who doesn't have the prototypical size that I like it, is Grayson McCall of Coastal Carolina, a guy who's just been a winner, guy who's accurate. Bryce Young-like in the sense that he sees what's happening. He knows what's going on in the field. His reads are terrific. Uh, he, he's very accurate, does a great job placing passes where only his receivers can come away with the ball. But again, he's not the biggest guy. He doesn't have the strongest arm. So you, you're going to have to design a system around him. I think uh, a guy that people aren't really talking about, and maybe I pay a little bit more attention to him because I am in the natural state of Arkansas, but KJ Jefferson over there and kind of what he's doing. I think when you just watch him, especially from what I saw from him before, it's like, oh man, balls all over the place. You see some ability, but I think this year he's kind of honed in a little bit. Hasn't been as sporadic with the accuracy. He's able to make plays. He kind of reminds me a little bit of like a Mississippi State Dak Prescott where He's not super athletic, but he can utilize his legs. You see enough arm strength and ability. And I think he's continuing to kind of put it together. Maybe the loss uh, to Texas a and last week doesn't help maybe how he's perceived. But I think overall, I've seen him doing a really good job and continuing to improve. And I think he'd even be further along if they would have elected to play him his freshman year over uh, Felipe Franks. Right. And I just thought like it's kind of a throwaway year. It was a COVID year. Play the young guy and let him kind of develop. Last year, he started to come along. I think this year he's continuing to get better. So uh, we'll see if he's a guy that potentially enters the draft. But I've seen him uh, progress each year. Well, and that's uh, in week to week. You want to see, OK, a, a tough loss against a and uh, You know, it's an up and down game for him. Wasn't great. Wasn't bad. Uh, but now he's got uh, Alabama coming up here this weekend. So how does he respond against a really good defense against, you know, not he's not facing off against Bryce Young, but Bryce Young on the other side, that, that'll be a big test for him. How does he mentally come back from that tough loss against a and &M? No time to think about it. You got to prepare for uh, the Alabama defense. And so very eager to see how he performs this weekend. Dan, want to just follow up on one thing before we say goodbye on Bryce Young. At some point, is it going to be held against him that maybe he doesn't have those weapons outside that the Mac Jones had, that Tua has? So maybe in the end, those numbers might not be as spectacular as maybe some of these guys before because you're not running out of Devontae Smith, or Jerry Judy, you know, all those guys. You know, because Alabama's receiving core isn't what it was before. Do you think that might catch up with him at some point this year? Well, I think we already have seen that it has, you know, again, the Texas yeah, against game, Texas, right? That, that's yeah. exactly what it was. But, you know, that's. Scouts know that, you know, they, that's why you know, the, the rule of scouting is traits over production. Uh, you know, it, it, if he has Heisman like numbers again this year, great. But I, teams are focusing on, uh, you know, the fact that the game just it's not too fast for him. The way he can process the way he he just has really good rhythm in his body uh, so he can make things happen. And so the fact that he's lifting his team where they have questions at wide receiver, the offensive line has not played well. No. They've, got a good, they've got a good running game. 
Uh, but, you know, Cameron Latu, his, his tight end, has been in and out of the lineup because he's been hurt. So there's a lot of things working against Bryce Young. They're still winning football games. And so I, we'll see how that continues here, the, the rest of the SEC schedule. But I, I think what has happened up to this point has only helped Bryce Young in terms of how, to, how scouts view him and how he'll translate to the next level. Dane, good stuff, man. Uh, tell everybody where they can find your stuff and uh, keep track of your uh, college football and NFL draft musings during the year. I like find everything on at the athletic um, and you can follow me on Twitter at uh, DP Brugler, do a, a film room every try to do a film room every Tuesday where I take the film from uh, the weekend from the college uh, games, you know, which really st- uh, stood out and do that kind of stuff. So uh, a lot of, a lot of draft content o- over at the athletic. So hopefully people go check it out. Dane, great stuff. Always good to see you, man. I know we're not heavy into draft season yet. We will be shortly. It comes fast. Enjoy the season. We'll talk to you down the road. All right, brother. All right. Thank you guys. Take care. We thank Dane Brewer from The Athletic for joining us on draft season. Once again, it's brought to you by Tommy Hilfiger, a PVH brand and an official partner of the New York Giants. Guys, we're on the quarterbacks here, so I guess let's stick with them. Dane mentioned Anthony Richardson before. I thought he played pretty well against Tennessee, but the couple games before that, the ball was kind of all over the place. Yeah. Te- I, I guarantee you we're going to get to, to, to January here if he decides he wants to declare. Some team's going to fall in love with the tools and say, we're going to figure this out, but he right now is, is your classic high risk, high reward pick for me uh, looking how he's playing this year. And I think it'll be really important, Tony, to your point, watching how he improves and develops during the season as he gets more playing time because he just really hasn't been a very experienced quarterback yet. Yeah, If he improves, yeah, you know, you yeah, got to hope there's, right. that, there's that improvement. I mean, he, listen, he's more athlete than he is quarterback at this point. Yeah. In my opinion. He's yeah. more thrower than he is passer. You know, he's very electric making plays with his legs. But, you know, so much of this is projecting to the next level. And as far as him being an NFL passer, he is light years away. And you're right. Someone's going to fall, absolutely fall in love with him and probably overdraft him. Unless there is a massive uh, upswing in his game, throwing the ball with the accuracy, with, with the passing fundamentals, the reading of the defense, uh, I, I think it's very premature for him to, to come out and it's going to be a huge learning curve at the next level. We'll see what happens. I like that. Dang, you know, he brought up what it looked like between KJ Jefferson and Bryce Young in this upcoming weekend's game. Well, last week we got to watch two guys and just kind of what it looked like and potential uh, NFL draft prospects, but you have DJ Ugalele. Right. His name right? All right. And Sam Hartman and, you know, they were both good. They, both, I mean, obviously, like, that was an extreme game for DJ as far as what we've seen throughout this year. But they were both really good in different areas. I thought Sam Hartman did a really good job of just maneuvering through the pressure, being able to step up in the pocket. I thought he worked the pocket extraordinarily well, throwing the ball downfield, dropping the ball in the bucket to the only place where his receiver can get it and away from the defender. I thought he was accurate. He made plays on the move. I think the only knock that might be on him right now is – you know, what's the arm strength look like? Because there were some balls that kind of floated a little bit, and I'm looking, I'm like, ah, NFL guys, they are really closing on those type of passes. And then on the other side of the ball, we had DJ, and, you know, I'm watching him, and I was just waiting for that that big game. I'm watching him each week, and it looks a little all over the place, and sometimes it looks like he doesn't know what's going on. Then you see a big-time play. I thought this was a game where he was giving guys opportunities. He's throwing, you know, over-the-shoulder outside of the defender only place his receiver can catch the ball giving guys opportunities back shoulder throws in the red zone where I thought were kind of NFL location type throws and we see the ability we see the big arm and I think he has enough athleticism but he's been all over the place I thought that was the most consistent throughout the game that we had seen especially as the game went on because even early on started off a little weird for DJ but then it started kind of getting comfortable, getting in the groove, and it got better as the game went on. So uh, those were two guys. It was interesting to see how they are different and their skill sets are different, but they both had extraordinary games. Yeah, Hartman is a tough guy not to love. I I mean, you watch him. He's a resilient quarterback. He doesn't have great talent around him at at Clemson. I mean, that Clemson offensive line was pretty much overmatched by that great uh, – the Wake Forest, I'm sorry. The Wake Forest offensive line was just overmatched by that great Clemson defensive line. But Hartman found the way to get it done. But he's done that the past three years. That's the thing about Hartman. But as you know, as Croc said, I mean, he's not the biggest guy in the world. He doesn't have a howitzer. He's going to be, I believe, a day three pick. And he's going to be one of those guys who's a, a terrific number two quarterback, a part-time starter. Ugalele, I mean, if you remember, you go back to the COVID season when uh, Trevor Lawrence 
uh, with tested positive for COVID and his Heisman candidacy went out the window because he missed two games. Ugalele came in and played phenomenal. I believe one of those games was against Notre Dame off the top yeah. of my head. And, and, and there were high expectations from him last year and he failed to live up to him. He's got the physical skills. Hopefully that Wake Forest game from this past Saturday is a turning point because he had a really good game. It's just that Sam Hartman was a little bit better. Yeah, no question about it. And guys, we do have um, anything on the quarterbacks that we missed that you guys want to touch on or add based on what we talked about so far before we move on? Uh, maybe Hendon Hooker, uh, a guy who, you know, you see athleticism, playmaking abilities, making throws. Again, another guy that you want to see uh, be more of a, was it how did how did how did Tony phrase it? A passer and not a thrower, or a thrower, not a passer? Thrower, not a passer. Yeah, not thrower. All right, yeah, you know, you want to see him be more consistent in that area. But uh I think he's a guy, you know, I can't wait to see. I believe he'll be at the senior bowl as well, right? Should he, I think he's a senior bowl watch quarterback. Yeah, I mean, two guys. Number one, Aiden O'Connell of Purdue. Some scouts love this guy. Uh, they thought he was a day two pick. I was a little bit cooler on him. But you watched that Syracuse game two weeks ago, and he was phenomenal. He was uh, Bryce Young precision-like. I mean, the way he moved Purdue down the field, they lost the game. But Aiden O'Connell was fantastic. And you talk to some people in the scouting community, and they absolutely love him. You know, one name when I was talking about quarterbacks that have failed to live up to expectations this year, Phil Jerkovic of uh, Boston College. And, and Jerkovic's one of those guys where thrower more than passer. Big arm quarterback, big body quarterback with a huge arm, but you don't know where the ball's going. Coming off the injury, which uh, halted uh, his 2021 season in the middle, really has never has never gotten it back uh, into gear. And as far as I'm concerned, he's the guy that he throws the ball, but you don't know where it's going. And he makes his receivers work too hard to come away with the reception. And, and I think he's the guy that has really failed to live up to expectations this year. Yeah, and, you know, I'll just throw something out about Levis. We touched on him briefly. You know, you watch – he. And this is the best way I can explain it. You watch him play quarterback, and he does have all the physical traits. He's big. He's got a strong arm. He can run. But it looks like you took a guy that played a different position his whole life and said, all right, now you're a quarterback. It just doesn't look fluid and natural to me. Like, he's like you watch Bryce Young. It looks like he's played a million of those seven-on-seven tournaments, right, where he's just flinging the ball around, blah, 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 blah. It just looks a little bit different with Levis. It looks like there, there's a lot of work still to be done to get him comfortable in that spot. That's why that's I, what I thought about DJ Ulelele, where he looks like the kid who is the biggest, strongest, biggest arm on the playground. And they were like, you know what? Let's just put you at quarterback because you have <laughs> this arm where you could throw a hundred yard field. Right. Um, and then you see him out there and he looks like he's kind of struggling to process defenses and, and whatnot. He's just going out there, just throwing the ball around. That's why I said Levis scares me. Uh, he really does because he, you know, he, he, he looks, he's appealing to the eye with the size, with the arm strength, you know, he stands out in that area and he makes some beautiful downfield throws on occasion, yep. but you go back to last year, if you, if you watch the 2021 film and there were times where he's leaving his, you know, he's stringing his uh, receivers out to get, to get smacked. You know, he's missing wide open receivers, needs a lot of work in his game. But again, if he goes to a postseason all-star game, senior ball, something like that, and he has three days of knockout practice, teams will fall in love with him. Yeah, when you have the tools and then you show, you know, in person to these scouts, people will tend to do that. No question about it. A um, couple of things I want to touch on here, guys. I don't believe since they haven't had a really big matchup yet, at least that we talked about on our first show. We haven't talked about many of the guys at Clemson yet in terms of prospects. They have a big game coming up against NC State. Um, so I figure this might be a good time if, if you guys have any, you know, takes or thoughts or opinions on some of the guys at Clemson this year that that you've liked what you've seen as we move ahead here in the college schedule. Any of you guys can take this. Just run with it. Well, obviously, Brise had that whole issue where his sister sadly passed away of cancer. So that obviously, you know, has been a justifiable interruption in his season. Uh, he was he got injured last year, but he is a big time player, as is Miles Murphy. I mean, Miles Murphy's out on the edge. He is a he's, you know, your typical athletic, explosive pass rusher from Clemson who can line up and uh, come out of a three point stance can stand over tackle. He's not just good up the field. He can flatten off the edge and, and chase in backside pursuit. He can play off the line on zone blitz. I love both of those guys. I think both of those guys are outstanding. I also like their two other guys, their tackle who I project to guard Jordan McFadden, who I have as a third round pick and Trenton Simpson, who is yeah. a slightly undersized linebacker, about 220 pounds, which is okay these days in the NFL. Phenomenal athlete. Goes sideline to sideline. 
uh, covers a lot of area on the field, forceful up the field on the blitz. Again, he's probably more second round material, but they've got some high end guys. Tyler Davis, even Tyler Davis, uh, who was injured last year, doesn't get the uh, same type of uh, pub, uh, pub as uh, Brise, but he's still a very explosive, uh, almost a three technique type of tackle, one gap tackle on the inside. Very good player. They've got a lot of uh, they've got a lot of talent there, a lot of next level talent after Brise that I think people are missing. People don't talk about. Croc, you can hit Clemson, or you want to hit another team, you can do that too, whatever you want to do. Well, well yeah, Clemson, they have Joseph Nada. Uh, he's a big right. receiver. I paid attention to him because I coached against him uh, when he was in high school out there in Folsom, California. And I'm waiting for him to take that next step. He's a guy who can play above the rim. He has a lot of ability and talent. He has a little brother that is talented. I'm pretty sure he's at a di- one of these Division One schools as well, playing running back. And I've been a little disappointed with what I've seen from him. And it might be one of those genu- Daniel Jan- – uh, Jaden Daniels, uh, Kayshawn Butte things where it's like, oh, the quarterback up and down, and maybe that makes the receiver a little inconsistent, but help your guy out, man. I, I haven't seen him take his game to the next level, so I'm I'm really excited to kind of watch him this weekend and see how he progresses throughout this year. Yeah, not you look at not. I mean, he played pretty well against Wake Forest. 33-inch arms, hands that are over 10 inches. So yeah. with all those physical demands, and he's not a slow guy. I mean, he's not, nah. he, he's not a, he's not a second gear uh, stretch the field type of guy, but he's not a big, slow receiver. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think he's sort of like the receiver version of Will Levis, if you will. You know, he looks the part and, and you see, you see the physical dimensions, and, but there's just a lot of questions about him. You know, we touched on this with Dane and, you know, I don't even think I asked him about it. I think he just brought it up on his own that he thought this, you know, relative to past classes, the wide receiver class might not be as strong. And this has been continuous, right? Last three or four years, the wide it's just been endless, you know, 10 receivers in the first two rounds, you know, just a ton of these guys. You know, what are you guys watching in terms of receivers? I know we touched on some of the guys like, you know, Butte, Addison, stuff like that. Uh, but, Craig, why don't we start with you here? Receivers that have kind of jumped out at you that you're keeping an eye on that you think as the season goes along here, to Tony's earlier point, might emerge as we get closer to the draft process. Yeah, you know, we talked about A.T. Perry and over there at Wake Forest and kind of what he did this weekend, but seeing a guy that's around six foot five and can play above the rim the way he can, you know, we're not seeing a lot of those guys come out every year, right? Where it's just tall, athletic, great ball skills. So uh, that's a guy who's now on my radar, and I'm going to continue to kind of watch him and see how he does uh, throughout the rest of this year. But it has been a little bit underwhelming. You know, other guys who I expected to do extremely well, a guy like Jermaine Burton, where is he at? You know, we talked about Alabama and not having the type of receivers that they've had in previous years. Well, he's supposed to be the guy there and transferring over from Georgia and just haven't seen it yet. Yeah, and again, at the point I brought up was a year ago, we were not talking about, you know, six receivers in the top 20 of the NFL draft. So it can change. But sure. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit higher on Smith and Najibba. I think that he is absolutely top 15 material. I mean, he is, he's got to stay healthy, but I think he's an explosive guy. Good on the Nick receiver, terrific vertical receiver. Uh, you want to look talk about a bigger body receiver? Cornelius Johnson of Michigan is a real good player. Someone who is is a quick possession receiver, if you will, wins out for the contested throw. And Kentucky's got a guy by the name of Tavian Robinson who played at Virginia Tech the prior two years. He was really good. He's an explosive game breaker. Uh, he made a nice catch Saturday night by uh, down the field from Will Levis. Under six foot tall, but a legitimate four four high four three guy. He's somebody to keep an eye on moving forward. And obviously, you know Rasheed Rice, who we talked about earlier. So Jacob Tony, you Cowling were- out of Arizona, that's another receiver. I've watched yeah. a lot of him this year catching the back twelve. Smaller guy, going to play in the slot, but he's been extremely dynamic, and he's kind of carrying an Arizona offense right now. UTEP transfer. The question with Cowling is how fast is he going to run at the uh, yeah. at the combine or or in the postseason. He's more, he's one of those guys who's more quick than fast, which is okay. Uh, you know, he's a good route runner. He separates through his routes. He's tough to cover, but if he doesn't run in the low four fours, the high four threes, which I don't think he's going to, it kind of just reduces his attractive attractiveness come draft weekend. Doesn't mean he's not going to be a good NFL player. All right. All right. Why don't we jump in here a little bit, guys, to the pass rushers. We talked, Dane talked about the defensive tackles and edge guys. And Tony, you said the same, you know, really the strength of this class up front on defense. You know, we touched on a few of those guys, but not a ton. Tony, let's start with you on this one. Who are some of the pass rushers that have really jumped out to you that you think we'll be talking about top 10, top 15, top 21st round when we get to April? 
one guy I, I've liked the past two years, I don't know that he's going to be top 15. Well, you, you know, you got Will Anderson of Alabama. I like Miles Murphy. Nolan Smith, although he's more of your traditional linebacker. We talked about Will McDonald, who's not having the uh, the year people thought he would. And, and one thing about Will McDonald is the scouts are concerned. You may not be able to put him in a very complex defense. You may have to keep his responsibilities to a minimum. Kind of falls off there. For that. I'm a big fan of Colby Wooden of Auburn. I have been the past couple of years. Again, a smaller one gap edge rusher, maybe stand up over a linebacker type of guy. You can drop him off the line, use him in, in space. Isaiah Folksky of Notre Dame. Yeah. These guys, I believe, are more, they're not, I, right now, I don't have them as top 20 picks. I think they're more, if they are first round picks, it's later first round, second round. Uh, uh, folks, and then Tyree Wilson of Texas Tech, who scouts love a lot, a lot, love a lot. And he fits the mold. He's one of those guys that uh, six, five and a half, 270 pounds, runs in the four sevens, very athletic, makes those splash plays. But I don't see Wilson being a consistent force on the field the way a lot of scouts would like him to be. Yeah, Foskey and Wilson. I mean, those are two guys that kind of, you know, jump out immediately to me when you look at, you know, height, weight, ability. Uh, I think Foskey looks to be more of a guy that's going to fit more of a 3-4 outside linebacker type scheme, more of a stand-up type pass rusher, but has the length uh, that I think a lot of teams will covet. Those are the pass rushers. How about the defensive tackles? You know, we talked about – we mentioned Jalen Saunders. I don't think we've talked much about him, though, Tony. So why don't you touch on him and any other of the big defensive tackles and guys inside – that uh, have impressed you heading into the year based on their tape last year and, and how they've done in the first month. Jalen Saunders or Jalen Carter? Oh, Jalen Carter. I'm sorry, Jalen Carter. Carter. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Carter's a guy who's played very well. Obviously, if you watch Georgia, this year, just like last year, they just rotate those guys because they've got so many of them, and why not? And Carter is very, very athletic. I don't think he's the same forceful, powerful guy as Mozzie Smith who, from Michigan, who I've, I've obviously fawned over a couple of times on this show because he's so big. And, and as we, you know, Bruce Feldman told us, he, he's incredibly athletic. Uh, Keanu Benton of Wisconsin, who we spoke about earlier, didn't have a game, a good game against uh, Ohio State, although nobody from Wisconsin had a good game against Ohio State. It's going up against a terrific center and Luke Whipler, but he's very athletic. Uh, Siaki Ika of Baylor, bigger, more nose tackle type guy, six foot four, 355 pounds, not really a playmaker. You're looking in that uh, day two uh, type of area. Tyler Davis of Clemson. Keandre Coburn of Texas is an interesting guy. Six, one and a half, 330 pounds. Uh, a guy who can play one gap, can play two gap. He's explosive. He's got to be, he's got to condition himself better because he seems to wear down very easily. As you would imagine at six, one and a half over 330 pounds. But he's a forceful guy. He's very quick. He's also athletic. He's not someone who just occupies the gaps. He can change direction, get down the line, and make plays uh, outside the box as well. Probably uh, a guy that kind of, you know, I want to mention Zach Pickens out of South Carolina. And there's a lot of bad going on there. But he's a guy to play in the interior. I don't think he's a day one type guy. And he's hoping that he could be a potential day two type guy. But that's another guy to kind of keep an eye on. Yeah, scouts do, like, do, scouts do think that Pickens could be a uh, – a second round, third round type of player. I have him graded a little bit lower. I want to see a bit more playmaking ability from him. But there are some in the scouting community who, who are, are, are the same mind of Croc that he's a day two type of prospect. Well, guys, we do have a few minutes here left. If we want to touch on any other topics, anything that's kind of struck you guys watching these prospects matchups this weekend, any players that have either got you pumped up or we haven't touched on, or maybe have you a little questioning the common conventional wisdom. I will open the floor. Either one of you go. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know about conventional wisdom because what is conventional wisdom at this point? You know, I mean, Twitter. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, my, that's where I was going. You know, people seem to fall in love with the guy, like I, we talked about earlier, based off of one performance, and, and it's a gradual buildup. You know, you, you got the you got the season, you got the postseason, you've got the the combine, you got the workouts. So I mean, you know, don't uh, don't get crazed uh, over any one person, any one player, at, uh, based off of a single game. Uh, I'll tell you, one guy that has surprised me, and I was not very high on him. Uh, coming into the season, and I've been pleasantly surprised by him, is Ben Bryant, the quarterback of Cincinnati, who I thought has played reasonably well. Transfer from Eastern Michigan to Cincinnati. He's done a good job leading that. Uh, he, he's gotten better as he's gotten more acclimated to that system. There are some scouts that believe that Ben Bryant, who is uh, 6'3", 215 pounds, was 
kind of a running quarterback at Eastern Michigan, could be a day two pick. I was, I had him more in the fifth round, but I'm starting to warm up to that because I thought he's, he's played very well. I think uh, for me, a guy that kind of, you know, I'm curious to keep watching is Bryce Ford Wheaton out of West Virginia, big, yeah. tall, athletic guy, and uh, watching him on the big stage against, or, you know, on ESPN against uh, P- Pittsburgh. I thought he was a guy who made a ton of plays. Now, one of the knocks on him is the drops. And we saw a huge drop in that game that resulted in an interception return for a touchdown. But as far as playmaking ability, being able to play above the rim and being one of those taller guys, and again, I think college football in the field is kind of moving away from the 6'3", 225 pound type receivers. And I think he kind of brings that element of it. So I'm curious to continue to keep watching him. You know, you were talking about the Clemson playing in NC State this uh, weekend. Clemson has uh, NC State's got a quarterback that a lot of scouts like in Devin Leary. More again, I go back to this: your Bryce Young type, not the biggest guy in the world, doesn't have a rifle arm, but very precise. You know, re- his his reads are right on, dissects the uh, defense, very accurate with outstanding pass placement. And again, one of those guys where you're going to have to kind of dismiss if not ignore the fact that he's not the biggest guy he doesn't have the strongest eye, a strongest arm and look at the mental intangibles one other guy to look at when he goes up against dj ugulele uh from north carolina state someone who i've like loved for the past uh, three years is isaiah moore the outside linebacker from north carolina state it's going to be a day three pick but he's got all the physical skills he's got the mental acumen he understands what's happening on the field he's got great instincts uh, he, he, they use him at, up the field on the blitz, play him off the line in space. I right now have him as a uh, fifth round pick. Scouts are a little bit, not as, not as a little bit cooler on him. Why? I don't know because the guy's been a three year starter, been very productive, except for uh, a small part last year when he was on, out of the, uh, out of, on the sidelines with injury. Let me throw one name out to you. I've watched a couple, a little bit of LSU last few weeks. You know, Aziz Ojulari is here with the Giants, and uh, you know, edge player. His brother, BJ, a 6'3", 250-pound junior at LSU. He's wearing number 18 for them. For the people that know, that's, you know, a big deal. And he's had some production, Tony. What are people saying about BJ? Is he a guy that could be a day-two guy? Uh, I, I mean, we got to find out what his true uh, height, well, height, weight, speed numbers is. It is, it is. Actually, kind of fun to watch and hear that name uh, constantly mentioned over and over. But right now, day two is possible. You want to see consistent improvement in his game. Got to find out what his real height, weight, speed numbers are. But he's playing very well. And, you know, every time his name pops up, you think of his brother who's playing with the Giants now. And it's funny, watching Richardson um, with Florida, I keep watching ATN's younger brother. I, I realize he's not draft eligible yet, but he's been a heck of a running back for them. And, you know, I know he's, he's on the show. I think he's only five, nine, right. But he's over 210 pounds. So he's thick. He's a guy in a couple of years, I think wouldn't be talking about as, as one of the better running backs in the draft class. Well, his brother wasn't that tall. I mean, his brother no. was, you know, sort of uh, that Swiss knife, Swiss army knife type of player that can do a lot of, a lot of different things. I'm sure uh, Florida fans like Ojolari. They, they like uh, ATN too. I'm sure they wish their team was winning a little bit more <laughs> with all this talent on the field. Man, you talk about guys that aren't draft eligible yet, and you start to look at next year and even the receiver class here, right? We're, we're like, this year uh, might be down. We'll see how it progresses throughout the year. But next year, man, I mean, you look at Marvin Harrison Jr., you look at Aronde Gadsden, that's a big receiver over there with Syracuse. You know, his dad played in the league. And then Xavier Worthy over there at Texas, man. I think that's going to be a big-time class of uh, 2024. All right, Tony, one of the things I'm going to throw at you just because of another uh, connection with the Giants, Howard Cross's son. Played mm-hmm. nose tackle for Notre Dame. Undersized. He's right. only like 280 pounds. Right. But he's had some really productive games, double-digit tackles in a game. And it's funny. We had Howard on one of our shows the other day, and he goes, and I warned him, you're getting all these tackles, so I'm going to start double-teaming you. And he's like, oh, it's going to be fine. And last week, they're throwing <laughs> two and three guys at him. He didn't do a whole lot. Uh, your thoughts on Howard Cross Jr.? He's a redshirt junior, so he not, doesn't necessarily have to come out. Your thoughts on on what you've seen from him? Yeah, three technique type of guy right now, unless he gets a little bit bigger and stronger. Athletic, your dad was a tight end, so obviously the bloodlines are there. He's just got to develop his game. He's got to just physically mature, get a little bit bigger, get a little bit stronger. And, you know, I mean, it's not been a good season for Notre Dame. No. Uh, and it, with Folksy out there, he should have his opportunities on the inside, or he's going to help create opportunities for Folksy with those double teams that he's uh, commanding. All right, finally, uh, let, 
let's do a little watch list. I, I mentioned the one game uh, coming up this weekend, uh, Clemson uh, taking on NC State. Any other games that you guys are really excited to see and maybe matchup or things that are on your agenda this weekend that if fans are tuning into college football, they have some free, t- free time on Saturday, that these are the games they should be tuning into and why. Tony, why don't we start with you? Well, LSU plays Auburn. That's always a good game in the SEC. Two teams that in the SEC that aren't playing all that well. I mean, the Auburn coach has got one foot out the door, but still, Colby Wooden, I mentioned him before. He's a terrific pass rusher. They've got some real good players. Let me pull up my list here real quick. Uh, on that defensive side of the ball at Auburn, Colby Wooden. They got another uh, pass rusher by the name of Derek Hall. Owen Popo, who is an explosive, undersized linebacker, goes sideline to sideline. They got a real nice uh, cornerback. Uh, Pritchett, when he goes up against Boutte, that'll be a, a good uh, a good matchup to watch. So Jaden Daniels against those Auburn prospects that you know are day two, day early day three guys that have been playing in the league. That's a good matchup to watch Saturday night. How about you, Croc? Any games you keep an eye on? Oh man, I'm I'm locked in. I might even go to the uh, Arkansas Alabama game. Nice. So uh, I think that's a big one over here in these parts. That's terrific, man. That's great. Fun. Any any chance that uh, Arkansas can pull the upset there? Oh man, you know we'll see. Teams have played Alabama tough. Now, obviously, you know Vanderbilt. And I actually trained a cornerback for Vanderbilt. Yeah. I heard my guy uh, Jeremy Lucine, and uh, they had a rough outing against Alabama. But I think Arkansas is going to be a little bit better, and we'll see. I mean, again, Texas. Alabama, who thought that game would come down to the last second drive? And we've seen uh, Bryce Young have to really battle through adversity. That's been really good to see. But, man, Arkansas, I think it'll be a good game. I love the baby picture in the background, by the way, Croc. That's new, right? I don't think I've noticed that one before. Is that yeah, new? Yeah, that's my, that's my daughter, children? Pickle. That's my daughter, Pickle. Uh, she's six years old now, so not, not so much a baby. But, yeah, wife did that for me. <laughs> no, I love it. I think it's great. All right, guys, uh, let's reconvene in a few weeks. Why don't we do something mid late October? Then we'll reconvene again during the Giants bye week just because, well, we got nothing else to talk about because the Giants are on a bye week. So <laughs> we'll try to pick it up maybe once every three weeks now instead of once a month. So we'll get a few more shows in before the sea before the college season is up and we uh, really get heavy into uh, two draft season. Guys, good stuff. Good to talk to you. We'll talk to you in a few weeks. All right. Look forward to it. All right. All right, that's draft season. We thank Dane Brugler for joining us. And again, it's brought to you by Tommy Hilfiger, a PVH brand and an official part of the New York Giants. And of course, make sure you check out our other Giants podcasts like the Giants Huddle Podcast, Big Blue Kickoff Live, and everything else we do here with the New York Football Giants on the Giants app, podcast platforms everywhere, and the Giants.com slash podcast. This is draft season. We'll see you next time.